All right, so um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Hannah Campbell. I am the Southeast Regional Director for FEMC and thank you so much for joining our virtual FEMC 2020 conference session um, with Miss Jamie. I'll introduce her in a minute. Um, our conference theme this year is taking a bite out of ocean education. So you'll see a common theme of sharks, although today we uh, will be talking about sea turtles. Um, so thank you so much for joining um, our virtual conference. Since it's important to FEMC that these virtual resources reach as many educators as possible, just wanted to give you a heads up that um, this session will be recorded and will be available for viewing following um, the presentation. So please feel free to share far and wide. It will be posted to our YouTube channel, um, which we will link in the chat box. Uh, the presentation will be about 40 to 45 minutes with time for questions at the end for a total of about an hour. So please feel free to type in your questions in the chat box on your screen throughout the presentation to answer as we go on. Um, Jamie will probably go right through her presentation, so just don't be shy, keep typing in the box. We will get to the Q&A um, after the presentation. So if there's nobody else pending, um, without further ado, I would love to introduce our presenter for the session, uh, Jamie Reniker. So Jamie received her graduate degree in 2016, but has worked in the sea turtle field for eight years. Over this time, she has conducted sea turtle nest monitoring surveys in North Carolina, Mississippi, and now Florida. She also spent two years with NOAA, studying factors that cause sea turtle strandings in the northern Gulf of Mexico. She currently manages a group of volunteers in New Smyrna Beach to conduct nesting surveys for Volusia County. So welcome, Jamie. Um, I'm gonna make you the host of this meeting now and you can go ahead and share your screen to give your presentation. Um, whenever you're ready, just start sharing and uh, take it away. All right. All right, uh, so thank you everybody for uh, tuning in this afternoon. I know we were all supposed to meet in person um, and you were supposed to be here in New Smyrna, um, which are now my stomping grounds. So um, feel free to come back and visit um, when things are, are safe to do so. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of jump right in because we do have um, a lot to talk about and then hopefully we make it through everything in time. Um, if you have any questions, like she said, go ahead and type them in the box and we'll answer them at the end. Um, so I'm just going to give you um, an outline of what we're going to talk about today. And first, we're just going to do a background um, on sea turtles, a little bit about their biology, um, just to kind of help set the stage for um, the rest of the presentation. Um, the next thing that we're going to touch on is um, part of my master's work, which was analyzing a 25-year data set, um, looking at differences between nesting mothers as well as environmental factors over that time span. Then we're gonna talk about the second half of my um, master's work, which was working um, on beach nourishment and how that might affect um, sand properties that would affect nest incubation. Lastly, we're gonna switch gears and talk about work I did in Mississippi, um, which involved um, using stranding data to better understand sea turtle biology. And then we'll just wrap everything up um, at the very end. So um, some of you may be familiar and, and others may not be, but there are seven species of sea turtles found worldwide, um, five of which um, have been documented off the Florida coast. Um, I should mention six, the Olive Ridley um, has been documented in the last couple years down south um, as a stranding. The most common turtles that we see here are gonna be the loggerhead, the green and the leatherback. Um, the hawksbill does make some rare appearances um, down south, especially in the Keys. And the Kemp's Ridley, which is the world's smallest species of sea turtle, it's also the um, most endangered of all of them, um, does use um, the waters off of Florida to travel up to the Northeast um, to forage. And we do have the occasional Kemp's Ridley nester um, here in Volusia County. Um, but for today's talk, we're gonna focus on the loggerhead sea turtle for the most part. So just a little bit about them. Um, they are the third biggest of all the sea turtle species. Um, they have the name the loggerhead because of their very large head. You can see in the photo on the left. Um, they need this because their primary food source are things like mollusks and clams, things with really hard shells. Um, so they have a lot of powerful jaw muscles um, in their head to, to crack down on 
on that, that type of food. They have a reddish brown um, carapace color to them um, and they're about three to four feet, 350 pounds when full grown. So they are pretty big if you've ever seen one um, out in the water or on the beach. Um, most people are pretty surprised that they actually get that big. Um, the loggerhead is also one of the most widely distributed of all the sea turtle species. They're found in all the major ocean basins. Um, there are nine distinct population segments for the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, the one off of our area here, um, they're all part of the Northwest Atlantic um, distinct population segment. So even though a lot of my work was done um, in North Carolina and in the Gulf of Mexico, um, it's all uh, the same population of loggerheads that we're going to be talking about. So most of my work has been um, with sea turtle nesting behavior. Um, like Hannah mentioned, I do manage the sea turtle nesting beach here in New Smyrna. Um, so they are, it's my favorite aspect of, of sea turtle biology. Um, so a little bit about um, their nesting behavior, and this is for sea turtles in general, but specifically the loggerhead. They take about 25 to 30 years to reach sexual maturity. So you can imagine it takes a long time for them to even be able to reproduce. Um, when the females do come ashore, they typically lay about three to five clutches in one nesting season. Um, they'll take a couple weeks off in between laying those clutches to rest up and produce another batch of eggs. Um, then they're going to take a couple years off. They'll return every two or three years um, to lay more clutches of eggs. It is um, a lot of work to produce um, that many eggs, so they, they take some time off in between. Um, each nest that they lay is about 100 to 120 eggs. Um, so that ad adds up pretty quickly. And then the nests take about 60 days to incubate. Um, nest will incubate a lot quicker if it's hotter outside. Uh, we average here about 55 days for incubation um, in the northern central part of Florida. Um, so sea turtles, like most reptiles, um, exhibit temperature-dependent sex determination. Um, and this means that the temperature that the eggs experience during incubation actually determines the sex of the hatchlings. Um, there is a, a potential, uh, this is where potential change in thermal properties of nesting beaches could play a role in um, proper development and sex production. Um, sex of the hatchlings is determined by a specific temperature, and that temperature is known as the pivotal temperature. For loggerheads here in the United States, um, most research agrees that it's right around 29 degrees Celsius. At that point, 50% uh, female hatchlings and 50% male hatchlings are produced. Um, there is a narrow range of temperatures surrounding that pivotal temperature that's going to produce um, a mix of both sexes. Um, but the warmer you get, the more females that you're going to produce, and the cooler that you are, the more males that you're going to produce. So keep this in mind as we talk about um, the differences uh, in nesting behavior and nesting beach properties moving through this presentation. Um, in general, sea turtles prefer to have wide open sandy beaches to come up and lay their eggs. Um, generally that does have a, a gradual slope reaching towards a low-lying back dune. Um, different species like to nest in different parts of the beach. You'll see green sea turtles and hawksbills going all the way up into the vegetation. Loggerheads um, will nest somewhere in the middle, but they also nest up near the dune. Um, but this is kind of uh, an ideal habitat for all species of sea turtle, um, specifically the loggerhead. Um, so here in the southeast United States, we have um, one of the most important nesting um, populations of the loggerhead sea turtle. Um, you can see that big purple dot off of uh, East Florida. Uh, we do have the largest proportion of females nesting um, in the state of Florida for the whole southeast United States. They do nest all the way up through South and North Carolina and a sprinkling of turtles will nest in Virginia, very, very rare. Um, just to kind of put it into perspective, last year in 2019, Florida documented over 100,000 um, loggerhead nests in the state, um, which was a very, very busy year um, for us. So we're hoping uh, it continues in that trend moving forward. Um, so all of my work for my master's degree was done in a little island um, in southeastern North Carolina. So North Carolina is an important um, nesting ground for these turtles as generally it's going to be a little bit cooler and we do anticipate that um, hatchlings produced off North Carolina beaches um, are um, hopefully producing males to get into the population. So that little black um, square shows the, the location of where a lot of this work was conducted. 
If you're not familiar with the North Carolina coast, um, this is Bald Head Island. Uh, it's near Wilmington, North Carolina, if you're familiar um, with that area. For North Carolina, it is a high density nesting beach. Um, it averages a little over 100 nests a year, uh, which to, to beaches in Florida, that's um, sometimes just an, in one day's work. Um, but it is an important nesting ground for the state of North Carolina. Like I mentioned before, it is the northern range um, for the loggerhead population, so it is um, an important nesting ground. And then the really cool thing about this island is that they had a, um, at the time of my research, 36 years of monitoring. They do what's called saturation tagging, so people are out every single night during nesting season and tagging individual mothers, taking measurements off of her, and getting a lot of information from individual nests. So a lot of good data um, comes from this small little island. Uh, so that brings us to the first portion of what I did for my master's work, which is looking at all of that data. And I know um, you guys don't know me, but if you did, you would know that I love data. I could sit in front of a computer and mine through it um, all day long if, if I had the option. So uh, what's really cool about this um, island is that they had 36 years of it. Um, only 25 of years we could actually use for this data analysis. Um, and that's from 91 to 2015. Prior to 1991, they weren't tagging the turtles the same way and they weren't taking um, as much data. So we started our analysis in 1991. Um, we needed to know who the mother was and we wanted to know how big she was. Um, each turtle had measurements taken while she was nesting. And then we needed info on um, different nest characteristics. We wanted to know where it was laid, when it was laid, um, how long it took to incubate before it hatched, and then how successful that nest was. And one of the big questions that we were asking during this whole thing was influences of individual mothers. That's what we were interested in. Um, so the first portion um, of my work that's uh, currently published and, and available on the internet is the maternal legacy. Um, so the three questions that we were asking ourselves is um, all, in relation to individual nesting moms. Uh, the first question we wanted to know was what's the best predictor of certain nest characteristics? Those characteristics we were most interested in was um, incubation duration or how long it took a nest to hatch, um, an estimated offspring sex ratio, um, and then how successful each nest was. We wanted to then know if individual mothers um, differed between themselves in respect to these three characteristics. And then lastly, we wanted to see if there was any evidence that mothers were behaviorally altering their nesting habits over that 24 year time span. So we used data from 1991 to 2014. And like I mentioned before, all the nests had to have these um, known data points for us to be able to use them. And then the moms themselves, we needed to have uh, carapace measurements, both their length and width, and they needed to lay more than two nests over that time span. This left us with a total of 156 individual nesting moms who laid 713 nests. Now I mentioned that one of the nest characteristics we were interested in is estimated sex ratio. Um, and we can't actually sex hatchlings um, when they come out of the nest. We don't know the sex of turtles until they're actually um, reproductively mature. Um, so what we did, was we just estimated using um, incubation duration. Um, so I mentioned how nests would hatch faster if it was hotter out, and the same goes um, for understanding that more females would be produced under hot conditions. So if nests incubated for a short time frame, um, we considered those to be relatively hot nests, and they would have produced more females. Those who incubated for a longer time, say 65 to 68 days, likely experienced very cool conditions and had the potential to produce more males. So um, not to go into the weeds, but we ran um, multiple multivariate models um, in order to determine um, what was the best predictor of, of different nest characteristics. And all of these um, variables went into the model. And overall, the winner for our nest characteristics was in fact maternal identity. So it didn't really matter where the nest was laid or um, the uh, time of year that it was laid. It really just was who the mom was that affected some of these nest characteristics. So we answered our first question. The best predictor was the um, individual mothers. So this is a scary graph um, at first, but I promise it's, it's really not that bad. Um, each individual point on here uh, represents all those moms that I talked about. So 156 different moms. 
Um, there on the left hand side, you see our estimated sex ratio or percent female hatchlings with more female hatchlings um, towards the top and more males down there at the bottom. That red line in the center is the 50-50 um, sex ratio um, of, of male and female hatchlings. Um, and what we found was that there were significant differences among the mothers in their nest sex ratios. If you see in the top right hand corner, um, some moms uh, consistently produced nests with a higher proportion of female hatchlings. And some moms all the way down there on the bottom left uh, produce nests that um, or laid nests that produced a lot more male hatchlings. The same thing was true for hatching success of nests. Um, we saw that some individual mothers were very, very successful and their nest hatched in the 90s to 100% success rate um, over their entire nesting history. And some moms didn't do so great. Um, that mom down there at the 30% um, uh, hatching success, uh, she's lovely. Uh, her name is Thomasina. Um, but she just never seemed to have very good success rates. So it's just interesting to show that um, we did see significant differences in between um, these individual moms. Um, so the last thing that we looked at, we wanted to see if these individual mothers were behaviorally altering their nesting habits. And we wanted to look at this because we do know that there's um, differences in, in climate over such a long um, time span of 24 years. So the IPCC predicts that the um, climate will continue to warm and surface temperatures will increase by 0.3 to 4.8 degrees uh, by 2100. One of the main areas of sea turtle research in regards to climate warming is the potential for highly female biased offspring sex ratios. Um, and this is already evident in some populations of loggerheads in the state of Florida, uh, Brazil, and then in some Mediterranean um, populations. So in the face of warming climate, one of the big questions is, will the mothers be able to adapt quickly enough? Uh, theory predicts that there are two traits um, in the face of increasing temperatures um, that will be able to adapt. The first is the sex ratio reaction norm, um, and the second is maternal nesting behavior. Um, there has been quite a bit of research on that first topic, the sex ratio reaction norm, and it appears for long-lived species like sea turtles, remember they take 25 to 30 years to reach sexual maturity, um, that the heritability of that is too low for them to be able to show strong responses to climate change. Um, so then maternal nesting behavior does become the critical trait um, in order for these um, turtles to be able to act in the face of, of warming temperatures. And one of the ways that turtles might be able to, to alter that is nesting at different times of year. So we looked at phenology. We wanted to see if turtles who nested earlier in the season or later in the season um, produced um, clutches with more males because uh, they would have incubated at cooler temperatures. Um, so what we found was that uh, mean day of year of when the turtles nested they did have a significant effect on both mean incubation duration and as you can imagine percent female hatchlings since they are related. That's what these two um, graphs are showing. So if females are consistent in their preference for nesting earlier versus later in the season, that might be an important difference that we saw um, from some moms producing highly um, female biased clutches and some producing um, male clutches. However, we did not find a significant difference between the moms and their day of nesting. And that's likely because individual turtles will nest every two or three weeks. So those who nest at the beginning of the season, they're going to lay about four clutches. So they do have um, uh, clutches who nest or incubate in the warmest part of the month. So since we didn't see that, um, the variability within females and their timing of nesting is likely not the main driver behind those sex ratio differences that we saw between um, the individual mothers. So the next thing that we looked at was where these turtles decided to nest. Um, and we did know in our um, models that we ran that beach location or beach zone was an important factor um, in determining how successful and um, the incubation duration of nests. Um, so knowing this, we tested, uh, we used a chi-square test to see if individual moms were consistent in, in nesting in particular beach zones. That map on the left, um, each one of those colors represents an individual mother. So you see the green dots. Um, she tended to nest in all one beach zone with one little nest down there just south of that. The turtle in red nested um, always on the east-facing beach towards the top 
of Bald Head Island. And then the orange turtle on the bottom, she liked to nest on the south. So we were seeing these turtles nesting consistently in the same beach zones over years and between years. So it appears that for sea turtles and for loggerheads in particular, at least for this group, um, their behavioral plasticity for uh, temporal and spatial nest site choice is constrained, which raises critical concerns um, for their ability to adjust in the face of climate change. So um, just to wrap up this little um, section about the influences of individual moms. Um, there is little evidence that temperature dependent sex determination is adaptive for a long lived reptile. So we would think that um, the mechanism for these turtles to adapt would be nest site choice or differences in the mom's nesting characteristics. Um, but we didn't really see that with our, with our individual mothers. They were nesting in the same spot um, throughout the same times of year. So there's little to no modification by these moms. Um, so that really begs the question as to what's going to happen as the climate continues to warm. So the second thing we looked at um, by using this data set um, was looking at changes over time for environmental factors. Um, so in this case, we looked at two factors, temperature um, and precipitation over the same time span that we were looking at before. Um, and we looked at the same nest characteristics, incubation duration, that estimated sex ratio, and then how successful nests were. And then we also wanted to see if the moms, um, if anything was changing um, in phenology, not necessarily at the individual level, but at the population level. Um, so we took historical temperature and precipitation data from local weather stations near Bald Head Island. Um, and we used mean temperatures from June to August, which is the peak um, nesting season for North Carolina, also the peak incubation season um, for most of the nests laid there. Um, and as you can see in the top right corner, uh, the, the graph shows mean temperature. And what it really clearly shows is, is a significant increase in temperature from 1991 to 2015, um, in upwards of three degree increase um, over that time span. Um, in contrast, we actually saw a decrease in precipitation over the same um, time span. Um, so then we looked at the, the same nest characteristics. We wanted to see how they were changing over time. Um, as you can imagine, since the temperatures were um, uh, significantly increasing, we saw a significant decrease in how long it took nests to hatch. So strikingly, nests were incubating at around 60 days for the state of North Carolina in the early 90s. And then they were incubating at just over 50, around 52 days um, by the, about 2015. So a significant decrease in how long it took nests to hatch. Um, that correlates with a estimated increase in female hatchlings. The good news is we didn't really see any change in um, hatching success over that time. Um, stays pretty consistent around 80%, which is typical for loggerheads um, in all populations. And then that last thing we looked at is we wanted to see if, if uh, turtles were starting to nest earlier um, in the seasons or if they were staying around the same time. So um, nesting starts here in Florida, typically in March, February, March for the leatherbacks and the loggerheads come in in April and they really start to ramp up here in May. North Carolina is a little late to the game, so they typically get their first nests um, in the, the mid-May. Um, but what we saw here was that turtles were actually nesting a little bit later in the nesting season and not coming in to nest um, earlier, which we would have thought if they were trying to mitigate some of those warming temperatures. So we wanted to see how these um, interacted with each other. Um, we, we looked at temperature and as you can um, quite clearly pick out uh, increased temperature significantly decreased incubation duration. Um, and that was the main driver behind that, which, which does make a lot of sense. And that um, in turn increased the percent of female hatchlings. So that really wasn't too much of a surprise. Um, we did note that there was a decrease in precipitation over that same time. However, uh, we saw that increased precipitation um, made nests less successful. So we saw a significant decrease in um, hatching success with increased rainfall. Um, and that's likely due to the nest not getting enough oxygen um, in order to produce um, successful hatchlings. Um, so implications for, for this is um, the same thing. You know, we're worried about increasing temperatures. Um, it does show that they shorten incubation durations, which often leads to more female hatchlings. 
Um, one other uh, side effect of shorter incubation durations and increased temperature um, is that nests may fail a lot quicker. Um, high temperatures um, lead to a higher rate of mortality for hatchlings and they don't often make it out of the nest. Um, so that's another concern besides the sex ratio. Um, and what we know about highly female bias sex ratios is that it often leads to decreased female fecundity. So the moms aren't just, are just not gonna be as successful as they were before. Um, and there's usually low fertilization success um, and egg production among females. So it is a concern, um, and especially for, for species that take so long to reach maturity um, that we need to make sure we're getting males into the population. Um, so the second half of my master's uh, work was in relation to beach nourishment. Um, so all of this work was in uh, all kind of tied around the same thing. We were interested in thermal properties. Um, and beach nourishment is a, is a popular, um, that's what I'm looking for, uh, a way to um, protect beachfront properties and um, tourist destinations um, all across the, the East Coast. Um, but we do, um, you can see a difference in the sand. So there's potentially a, a way that this um, is detrimental to nests. Um, so that's what we were gonna be looking at um, for beach nourishment because we did know that moms continued to come back to the same spot and they weren't changing where they were going. So if they had to come up and nest on the beach that was nourished, uh, we wanted to see if that would affect um, the success of their nests. So like I mentioned, um, many barrier islands along the East Coast, they do experience high rates of erosion. And um, in an effort to um, protect some of these beachfront properties, many beaches implement beach nourishment. Um, this is a temporary fix for erosion and it's been used along the East Coast since the early 1900s. Um, although it's true that beach nourishment widens many beaches, it does potentially create, or it does create more habitat for nesting sea turtles. Um, there are possible detrimental effects as well. Beach nourishment um, can alter the slope and shape of the beach. I mentioned turtles like that gradual slope leading up to the dune. It can create these escarpments that you see in that picture there, um, and that would stop a turtle from making her way up um, onto the beach to nest. If she nested below that scarp, her eggs would likely not be successful. They'd be washed over constantly throughout the season. And the sand used in nourishment projects is often dredged from channels um, offshore and has a different appearance than our natural sand beaches. In the lower right corner, um, you see the sand from a nourishment project on the left. It's very coarse, um, it's a lot darker in color than the natural sand that's from um, that very same beach just down the way. Um, the dark coarse sand does have implication, implications on eggs incubating in sea turtle nests as they tend to retain heat better, um, uh, causing that nest to incubate at warmer temperatures. Um, while the finer sands of natural beaches tend to hold water more effectively, which leads to cooler temperatures over incubation. Um, so our research focus um, for this was to determine the effects of beach nourishment on uh, temperature. We wanted to see how it changed sand composition. Uh, we looked at the sand's albedo or its reflectance of the sun. And then in terms of nest uh, characteristics, we were looking at nest success. And again, um, me and my advisor were really interested in, in nest sex ratio, so we were looking at that estimated sex ratio. There was a lot of uh, pilot work done before the 2015 um, nesting season from 2012 to 2014. We had a lot of temperature data already collected, um, and what that showed was down there on the southern beaches um, and in that corner, that's Bald Head Island, um, they were producing on average about 90% female hatchlings. And again, those are just our estimates from um, the temperature that we collected as well as incubation durations. Um, but like I mentioned before, North Carolina is a very important nesting grounds for these turtles as the nests um, or the beaches much farther north um, incubate at a lot cooler temperatures. So what we wanted to do was to kind of get an idea of the entire state of North Carolina and see how beach nourishment um, played a role in male production farther north. Um, so uh, this is just where we placed all of our temperature loggers where we did our research. Um, Bald Head Island pops up there again because we had so much data from it already. And then our most northern site was Pea Island and that's up in the outer banks of North Carolina. Um, it's one of the few areas uh, farther north that was actually nourished. Um, the outer banks typically don't get um, re-nourished very often. Um, one of the things that we noticed from uh, some work on Bald Head Island was that um, an important factor in um, 
leading to different temperatures was how recently beaches were nourished. So all of these beaches had been nourished within two years. Um, it is very likely that within three to four years after nourishment, those beaches do tend to go back to a more natural state. So we wanted to make sure we were collecting data on freshly nourished um, beaches. So what we did is we used these hobo pendant temperature loggers and we placed them in the ground on all of our beaches. We had four different transect locations. Um, each beach had two nourished areas and each beach had two natural. We placed them at two beach zones near the vegetation and in the open. Like I mentioned before, that's where turtles um, typically like to nest. They don't generally nest near the high tide line um, as that would cause their nest to get overwashed during the season. And we put um, a logger at one depth. We chose 45 centimeters. That's the average middle of a logger head clutch. Um, so it would represent kind of what eggs would experience um, during that time. All of these loggers were placed in May and left to record um, temperatures every hour through October. So we had a wide range of, of temperature data um, for a very long time span um, that, that encompasses the entire nesting season. And I won't bore you with the details, um, but in short, really what we found was that every single beach um, had significantly warmer temperatures on the nourished beach than the natural. So the, the red bars you see there are the nourished sands and the natural is blue and each beach uh, was significantly warmer. That black line shows the pivotal temperature of 29 degrees. So you do see that some of the beaches were incubating at much warmer temperatures than um, we would like to see for, for that male production. Um, the way these are organized is just from south to north. Um, so you would have, in, in our minds, we thought the southern beaches would be the warmest and our northern beaches would be the coolest. Um, but that actually wasn't the case. Emerald Isle um, was actually one of the warmer beaches. Um, and what we found out when we looked at that was that those three, Ocean Isle, Baldhead, and Emerald Isle were south facing beaches. And the other two, the two coolest beaches that we looked at were actually east facing, um, which for the state of Florida, um, most of the beaches here are east facing, um, but we hadn't really thought about uh, beaches that face south. So they're gonna get a little bit more sun in the day than those east facing beaches. So that's just something interesting that we came across uh, while looking at the data. If we look at our um, two most drastic beaches, Bald Head Island was the warmest over the entire nesting season. Um, and you can see there in, in July and August how warm the nests were incubating, even in the natural sands, um, 30 to 31 degrees, well above that temperature of 29 degrees. Um, July and August is one of the more important times for um, the eggs, because that is when the sex usually is determined. Pea Island, uh, that was our coolest site um, up there in the north. Again, it did go above 29 degrees in July, um, but what we saw was interesting was how the beaches, um, they acted about the same when the temperatures got cooler. So in September, we didn't really see much of a difference between nourished and natural sands. Um, so we saw drastic differences when it was hotter and more natural comparisons when it was cooler out. Um, so we, we had to think that there was something going on that would cause different temperatures between the beaches. Um, and really the only way that that would happen was because of the sand. So we looked at the sand in two different ways. We wanted to look at the composition of the sand. So we used a sieve um, to break up the sand into different size classes. And then we used a light meter um, to look at the albedo and see how much light reflected off the surface. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't have enough data to really find any um, uh, significant conclusions, but we were seeing some trends. Um, so there on the left, you see a, a wide range of sand samples collected from nourished and natural beaches. Um, down there on the, the bottom left is side-by-side -side comparison from Bald Head Island, um, the nourished sand. And really what sticks out like the other picture before is how much darker it is and how much coarser. It's a lot bigger shell particles than that, that fine natural um, white sand. In both types of nourished and natural beaches, this small grain size was the most common, um, which really isn't too much of a surprise. Um, but then when you get into the medium, large, and extra large size classes, that's when the nourishment really starts to um, uh, take over the natural. So we have coarser sands in the nourishment, which you can see by the, the naked eye, but um, just goes to show that when you actually sieve it out, that's how it comes out to play. But like I said, we didn't have enough sand samples to really 
um, get any significant differences here. The other thing we looked at was albedo. Um, and again, you can see the color difference between natural and nourished beaches. Um, so likely those darker sands are gonna absorb more heat, which is leading to the warmer temperatures um, that we were seeing. And that's um, what we saw when we looked at the reflectance. So the natural beaches had a higher percent of reflectance, so more sun was bouncing off, and the nourishment was soaking in a lot of those sun rays, um, uh, leading to lower reflectance values. Um, and th these were significantly different. Um, so these are all related to sea turtle nests. So what we did was we wanted to see how um, the, the sand composition affected the temperature because that's what we're looking at. Um, the top left graph there um, shows the mean grain size of our sand samples uh, increasing in coarseness from left to right. Um, and we do see a significant increase in temperature. So the coarser the sand gets, the warmer the sand gets. Um, that percent small grains I mentioned was our most popular sand size. So we just wanted to look at that um, individually and see if there's anything going on. And we did see a significant decrease in temperature as we got more um, small grains in our sample, which makes sense um, with our natural beaches being more fine. Uh, we do see that cooler temperature. Um, the reflectance, uh, the light meter that we used uh, didn't have the best accuracy, so we don't have quite the range of spectrums that we were looking for, um, but we did see um, a decrease in temperature as reflectance got higher. Um, so we do see that trend, but we did need a little bit more data um, in order to make that um, really stick. But you can see there on the left that low uh, reflectance was leading to much warmer temperatures in the 30 um, degrees Celsius. And then the last thing I mentioned that we wanted to look at was the time sense nourishment. Um, so we do think that beaches go back to a more natural state after about three or four years of being nourished. Um, and so all of our study beaches were nourished either that year or within two. Um, and this, this was not significant, but we did see a decreasing trend in average temperature over the nesting season um, with the most recently nourished beaches incubating warmer than um, those who were nourished previously. Um, so what we found was that sand characteristics did appear to play an important role in beach temperature. Um, nourished beaches um, overall and all of our study sites did have significantly warmer temperatures than natural. Um, the good news was that there was no effect of hatching success on nourishment. So nests still hatched successfully, um, turtles were able to make it to the water, and, and that was all fine. Um, beach nourishment is a preferred method of coastal armoring. It's not as destructive to the natural habitat as things like seawalls and rock revetments, which would obstruct turtles from even nesting at all. So it is a good option. Um, and there is a lot of ongoing research, especially in Florida, to ensure that these nourishment projects do mimic natural beaches um, to the best of their ability. Um, and this research uh, for North Carolina was picked up by a second grad student um, who's been working over the last three years um, to get more of that SANS um, data and also um, really nail down some of those albedo measurements. So this is still ongoing research um, up there. Okay, so that's kind of a whole lot about sea turtles nesting and uh, different thermal properties and, and what might affect um, mom's choices on the beach. We're going to totally switch gears and talk about um, a different aspect of sea turtle biology that's not often studied um, but is is very very unique and I think it's really cool so I wanted to touch on it and that is using stranding data to better understand kind of the life history of sea turtles. So there are quite a few threats to turtles. Um, we do see threats uh, and predators on our nesting beaches, um, raccoons, uh, coyotes. We have a coyote um, problem here in New Smyrna, they've, they've found that they can depredate our nests. Um, that's what you see in the lower left-hand corner. Um, we also have habitat alterations um, that are a threat to sea turtles. Uh, sea walls and revetments, they tend to um, cut the beach so the turtles don't have as much spot to nest in. These often cause uh, sea turtles to false crawl so they don't actually lay their eggs when they need to or they have to lay their eggs in a, in a spot that's not really ideal. And then of course there are threats um, out in the open ocean. Um, she mentioned sharks at the beginning and sharks really they are the main predator for sea turtles out in the open ocean. Um, same as killer whales for adult turtles. Once they reach um, sexual maturity, they're, they're pretty big. Um, so not much is gonna get them. 
um, at that size. But unfortunately, there are some human impacts um, out at sea, especially in the fisheries industry, um, with turtles getting trapped in nets, um, getting hooked on long lines. Um, and that's something that is still um, being researched a lot and, and trying to figure out how we can and help in the open ocean. Um, so when a turtle does die at sea, um, it often sinks to the bottom of the ocean and then will float to the surface. At that point, um, it kind of travels around in the ocean currents and often strands on um, our beaches as a what we refer to as a sea turtle stranding. Most times they do come in um, deceased, sometimes they're alive, um, and at that point they're usually uh, very lethargic and probably sick um, from something um, that happened out to them. But we do get a lot of important data from strandings when they do beach on our, um, on our shores. Across the entire Southeast United States, there's a standardized data collection um, from permitted individuals who can um, go out there and collect valuable information from all of these turtles. We collect things like the species. Uh, we do measurements again. We want to know how big the turtle was. We want to know if it was tagged. Um, some research projects do tag turtles, so we want to know if um, any turtle came in tagged. Where it stranded, that's important, and then the condition of the turtle, whether it's alive um, or whether it's dead, and how decomposed that turtle is. Um, these stranding data can be used to identify mortality sources, um, areas of concern, and trends in stranding um, history for particular areas. Strandings can also be used in a wide variety of research. Um, we actually can't age sea turtles based off of how they look like or what they look like, how big they are. Um, but there's a researcher out of North Carolina who figured out that turtles grow rings in their humeri, just like trees do. Um, so we were salvaging a lot of turtles for her to be able to age them at different size classes, which is really neat. And then strandings can also be used as an indicator for at sea mortality. Um, oftentimes what we see on the beach isn't um, at all the turtles that die out in the open ocean. Um, so the objectives for this um, little study here was to um, determine the percent of carcasses that would strand in the northern Gulf of Mexico. So this is work conducted in Mississippi. And then we wanted to see how effective the stranding network was. We wanted to know how many of those turtles actually were reported. So documented sea turtle strandings, they really only represent a minimum measure of mortality. Um, that's because a lot of factors go into whether or not a turtle is actually going to strand after it dies. Things like the time of year, um, where you are geographically, um, how fast a turtle is going to decompose, and then oceanic and atmospheric conditions that would push a carcass to shore. Um, so one of the great things about this study is that we were actually able to use fresh dead cold stun um, carcasses from North Carolina, New England, and Texas. Um, so these turtles died during a cold stun event. Um, they are ectotherms. When the temperatures um, drop too low too quickly, um, unfortunately, they, they do come ashore um, and, and oftentimes haven't made it. Um, sometimes um, they are just very lethargic and they just need to be warmed up and then off to sea they go back in warmer waters. Um, but these turtles all um, died and they were very fresh when they came ashore, so that was how we used them. Uh, we tagged all of our turtles, uh, we warmed them up from the freezer so that we could use them for our study, and we attached little satellite tags in peanut butter jars that we attached to the back of the turtle. Um, remember, the point of this is to see what happens after a turtle dies out in the ocean. We want to see where it's going to travel. The picture in the bottom right, um, these are effigies. So they're just wooden blocks, um, but they were made to mimic um, what a sea turtle carcass would do out in the open ocean. They float just like a sea turtle carcass would. So we put those out with all of our turtles um, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so like I mentioned, this study was all conducted in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. Um, it's, it's a really great area to, to have a better understanding of, of sea turtle strandings. Um, so if you're familiar with Mississippi, that's what's going on there. We had three deployment locations, um, and these were chosen based off of known sea turtle occurrence. So we knew sea turtles hung out in those areas, um, but we also knew that there was some sort of human interaction as well. Um, our inshore site had, was in the um, midst of a shipping channel, and then our offshore sites um, were high areas of fishing, um, shrimp trawling, um, and, and big in the fishing industries out there. 
Uh, we deployed carcasses every two weeks for an entire year. So every two weeks in 2017, we um, took a boat out to each one of these sites and we deployed our carcasses and our effigies off the side of the boat, which you can see in the pictures there. Um, so all our turtles were then left to float naturally um, and then we followed them with those GPS tags until they beached. In total, we deployed 282 objects. 100 of those were effigies and the 182 were actual sea turtle carcasses. Um, so after they floated out at sea, um, we wanted to see what happened to them, right? That was the whole point. So um, just over, uh, well, 35%, 64 of our uh, carcasses beached intact. So you see that picture there, um, that turtle beached with its satellite tag um, still attached. 58 of them beached just the tag. So something happened to the carcass um, out at sea. Uh, you can see that frayed end of the, the orange string, and these were likely um, predation events. So we talked about sharks, um, and we saw that these, these tags and, and string were just ripped in half. So likely um, some sort of predator took that carcass. And then seven of our tags washed ashore with just a piece of the shell remaining. These carcasses likely decomposed in the warm temperatures before beaching. Um, we did lose transmission on 21 occasions, and this happened within hours of deployment, and we believe this was also due to predation. Um, the tags just lost service. The batteries died in some, and then others beached in remote locations we couldn't retrieve. Uh, we, the effigies, we had a very high success rate. Predators don't often go after blocks of wood, um, so 81 of those actually beached with their tags attached. Um, and then we had the batteries die and, and were unable to recover almost 20 of the effigies. Um, so the second part of, of what we did was we wanted to test the effectiveness of, of people reporting sea turtle carcasses. That's why we tagged all of our turtles so we knew um, who each turtle was and we knew where it beached because of that satellite tag. Um, so of the 64 carcasses that beached, 24 of them beached on the mainland Mississippi, which is what most frequented by the public. 22 beached um, on the barrier islands, which are national seashore, Gulf Islands national seashore, and then 18 beached in really isolated areas. Um, if you've been in, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, you know it's very marshy, um, so a lot of our carcasses ended up over there and would likely never be reported. So overall, we had a 30% public report rate, um, and which was a little lower than we anticipated. We thought we'd get more reports. Um, but if we look at just the mainland beaches that are highly trafficked, we had 54% of our carcasses were actually reported. So pretty successful in terms of that. Um, and one of the reasons we, we did this study was we wanted to, to look at trends behind some of these peaks that we saw in Mississippi stranding numbers. So peak stranding season for Mississippi is typically March through June, um, and there's usually a second peak in November. So you see that here um, in the actual stranding data from 2017. Um, what's really cool is if we put our carcasses um, on top of this graph, our carcasses beached during the same months that we had actual sea turtle strandings, um, April and June and November. Um, so we're like, okay, this is actually working. Um, turtles are coming ashore. Um, so why, why are turtles coming ashore in March, April, and May, and not so much during the peak um, summer months of, of June, July, and August? And if we look at it uh, from a drift perspective, this is a deployment from April, which is um, one of the peak months um, of sea turtle strandings. Usually the winds are on shore coming from the south. So all of our carcasses beached within a day um, they all drifted straight north and beached on all of the mainland and barrier islands, which would explain why we would see sea turtle strandings in the month of April. In comparison, if we look at July, it looks just like a big spaghetti plot. Um, if you've, <laughs> again, ever been in the Gulf of Mexico in July and August, it's very hot, stagnant, there's not a lot of breeze. Um, so our turtles often just floated around, uh, went out to the Gulf of Mexico. These were a lot of where our batteries died because they just went out to sea and they never came on shore. So this just shows why we don't see sea turtle stranding during summer months um, in Mississippi. Um, so just to wrap up this little section, um, we were very pleased and excited that our carcass drift carcasses um, mirrored what we see in actual stranding numbers. 
Um, it does show the seasonal variability in the different times of year, which helps stranding uh, coordinators uh, prepare for different times of year and also can watch local weather. Okay, we have onshore winds, so we do expect carcasses to come onshore um, if they're dying out at sea. Um, we did have a pretty good report rate there on our mainland beaches, just over 50%. Um, but we did determine that the Barrier Islands was a trouble spot for um, reporting of sea turtle carcasses. The islands are really, really large out there and people don't often traverse the whole section. So oftentimes um, there's probably more turtles that have washed up on shore that we just don't have um, accounts of. Um, we learned that effigies are a good proxy for carcasses. Um, they often beached within um, a very short distance and a very short time of our, of our sea turtle carcasses from the same deployment sites. Um, so that means that the study is actually transferable. Um, and I can say that it is being done um, in different areas also using effigies. So it can really help other stranding networks determine when turtles might come ashore. And it also helps us backtrack um, to see where these turtles might be dying, if there's any sort of fishery interaction involved um, with that. Um, so just to kind of put a nice pretty little bow on a lot of different topics of, of sea turtle research, um, we all know that the climate is changing, um, the climate continues to warm, we see stronger storm events, um, and so we, we are concerned about how turtles might um, change their nesting behavior and, and mitigate some of these the factors. Um, but what we saw was that there was limited behavioral plasticity among the mothers to alter their nest site choice, so they kept coming back to the same spot, the same times of years, um, so it's likely that they're not able to change um, where they're nesting um, quickly enough to, to mitigate that, that climate. Um, there are some aspects of beach nourishment um, that could affect nest incubation, um, mainly temperature, but not success. Um, remember, we didn't see any um, impact on hatching success, only that nests incubated at um, warmer temperatures than natural beaches. And then the use of stranding data is really an important aspect of sea turtle research that's just kind of coming into the fold. Um, a lot more work's being done in the Gulf of Mexico to determine um, decomposition of sea turtles um, so we can really pinpoint um, at sea mortality and get a better idea of how we can um, help sea turtles out in the open ocean. Um, so I did mention that some of this work is already published, um, both the, the maternal work and climate changes um, on Bald Head Island are, are published. There's a couple of, of NOAA technical memos that are out there as well for the, the stranding and decomposition work. Um, and then all of this um, is still ongoing. So you can look for more uh, research that's coming out in the next, hopefully within this year, you'll see three or four more papers on this. Um, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Um, there's really too many people to thank for all the work. Um, like Hannah mentioned, I've been doing this for about eight years now. Um, but I got my start on Bald Head Island. I got my master's degree at UNCW. Uh, did spend some time with NOAA, and uh, now I'm with um, Ecological Associates, and I work in Volusia County. So um, none of us can do what we do without the help of others. So um, I'll do a shout out to everybody um, in that way. And I guess, uh, I don't know how I did on time. I went over. You didn't stop me. Uh, I didn't stop you. <laughs> <laughs> you could have stopped me. Yeah. No, that was great. Thank you so much, Jamie. Um, we do have some questions. I'm just going to rattle them off to you um, in the next uh, five. And if anybody wants to stick around the next maybe 10 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to scroll back. We had a, an early question from one of the attendees. And this goes back to, um, I believe, your maternity study. So um, it was, so just to clarify, one of the questions this person hears a lot, Enya is whether or not we are seeing sea turtles adapting to climate change. Based on what you had presented, um, she, Enya thinks she's come to understand that we are not seeing adaptations. Is that correct? Or are you seeing that they're adapting? Um, so, so what we saw was that individual moms over that time span really weren't changing what they were doing. So they were still nesting in the same locations and they were still nesting at the same time of year. So over that time span in this population, we weren't seeing them um, alter their nesting behavior in any way. We need to look more fine scale at um, what the mothers are doing to see if they're adapting. Nice. Okay, um, so going to your, your stranding, um, we had a question from Todd. So the, the, the strandings that the turtles that are washing up, they don't get eaten or break down biologically. Do you account for those variables? 
Um, I guess I'm not quite sure in what aspect of, of actual sea turtle strandings or just. So let me see if I can actually unmute Todd. Todd, uh, you're unmuted if you want to go ahead and ask. Yeah, my, my question was, um, I was in regards to your, the floating objects, I forget what you called them. The effigies, yes. Yes, those things. So when you re, I was trying to follow the, I understand the general purpose for tracking it, but then you had included, it was the idea of where they would land mm -hmm. and, and not so much the fact that they might get eaten or whatnot, because there's the two variables I was mentioning were the two things that aren't going to happen to them. Right. That would right. happen to the other things. And so they, they just kind of let you know where they would have floated to if they hadn't been yeah. digested or broken down. Yes, um, and really what we found from doing this over an entire year is we, we knew how long a turtle would actually last out in the open ocean. Um, so if it was July and it was 32 degrees in the Gulf of Mexico, the, the turtle carcasses weren't gonna last more than four days. Um, so if that, if that effigy beached 12 days later, we knew a turtle would never make it there. Um, gotcha. and then yes, so our effigies beached because they weren't um, predated on um, and since we ran the the test for an entire year we could back calculate um, carcasses that were actually predation um, versus those that would actually make it ashore. Okay so that okay thank you I just not seeing the actual data and trying to figure out what the goal was and that makes total sense thank you. Yes. Thanks Todd. All right, so Karen uh, wants to know, how is the use of TEDs being enforced these days? Does Louisiana still choose to not enforce TEDs? Um, I don't know specifically for the state of Louisiana, um, but there is a, um, a harvesting team out of uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi, uh, the gear monitoring team, um, and they travel the entire uh, stretch of the Gulf of Mexico and they do inspections on, on fishing boats um, for TED compliance. Um, so I do know that compliance is, is really good in Mississippi. Um, I didn't do too much work in Louisiana, so I can't speak um, for the state um, specifically there. Um, but NOAA and NIMPS, they do a very good job of, of monitoring TED compliance in the Gulf. Karen, I, I went ahead and I unmuted you. Did you want to elaborate on that question at all or respond? Maybe she's just listening intently. <laughs> oh, she said, thank you. Don't have a mic in the chat box. Um, and you had another question. Do you, um, do you know of changes that might happen in strandings when it comes to storms? Um, obviously, that'd be a big question along the eastern seaboard. Um, are there more strandings with storms, or do you think the carcasses would drift farther out in that situation? Um, that's actually a really good question. So one of the peaks that uh, we saw in the graph uh, for June was when Tropical Storm Cindy came through um, the Gulf of Mexico in 2017 and pushed all of our carcasses on shore uh, very, very quickly. So we were pleased to be able to deploy those carcasses right before a storm. Um, and yes, they were pushed right on shore. So if turtles did die before a storm, we would expect them to, to wash on shore. Um, but it really would depend on, on where you were if you were on the East Coast. Um, and, and kind of how those ocean currents were, were traveling. All right, just, uh, just one more here, unless anybody wants to get typing some questions to Jamie. What an awesome presentation. Um, Alex wants to know, has there been any proposed plans or possible solutions to mitigate the low behavioral plasticity? Um, not that I know of, and I think that's, if I'm understanding the correct the question correctly, that's not really anything that we can do. Um, these turtles take so long to reach maturity that the information that's passed in the genes from the mom to the hatchlings, um, it's gonna take 25 years for that hatchling to come back to the beach. Um, turtles do tend to nest on the same beach that they were born or relatively close um, to where they were hatched from. So if a turtle is laid uh, here in New Smyrna Beach and she hatches off here, if she comes back 25 years later and the beach isn't here, um, she doesn't know any different. Um, so I don't, I don't really know that there's any way for, for us to get at um, how the moms are gonna behave. It just takes so long for them to, to change what they do over their lifespan. 
So Alex, I'm just gonna unmute you real quick if you wanna elaborate. Um, that makes complete sense. I was mainly just thinking if there was any possible um, like human ways we could um, not really interfere, but uh, just impact their um, environments so that they might have a better chance of um, having a more moderate level of variation in the gender of hatchlings. Just because I know that's an issue, not only with sea turtles, but um, reptiles. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I haven't really thought, um, you know, too specifically on that particular question. Um, but really what I'm interested in, and I've, I've looked at it a little bit, is more of those fine scale changes. Um, some previous work I did before was with painted turtles, and we saw that, that moms were actually digging their nests deeper, um, and those nests were cooler. Um, so in that sense, the painted turtle was adjusting its behavior and nesting under shade trees to get cooler nests, but sea turtles don't really have that option. Um, yep. If you've ever watched a sea turtle nest, uh, they're going to dig until they can't pull any more sand out. Um, so they really have already gone as deep as they possibly can, and we don't really have a whole lot of shade. Um, okay. So that's what I'm interested in, is kind of more fine scale. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Um, let's see, just one more question. I, th I think here, more of a general question, maybe one after this one. We'll cap it at two more because we're hitting an hour now. So um, Natalie wants to know, um, Natalie's heard of a black sea turtle. Is this a subspecies? So a little bit more general. Uh, yeah, so the black turtle is, um, I guess, considered a subspecies of the green sea turtle, um, more than the Pacific over near Hawaii. Thanks. Okay. So uh, Todd again had a question for you. Do you layer current data on your modeling um, as, a, as in ocean current data? Uh, yeah, so you're, you're jumping the gun there um, with some of what we did. So um, a lot of this work is to be able to make drift models. Um, and so this study was used as kind of the, the base for all this modeling um, and, and years past all the way back to 2015. Um, so yes, it is layered on top of um, you know, real time atmosphere and ocean currents so that we can backtrack if a turtle dies um, in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, we know how decomposed it is. We can plug it into our model and go back and see potentially where um, that mortality occurred. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thanks, Jamie. Um, I do have a couple housekeeping things, and I know that as soon as I said that, the numbers are going to drastically fall in this, in this meeting. So I'm going to try and talk very quickly to all of you. Um, thank you again for joining um, the FEMC members. Um, if you're not a FEMC member and you heard about this through the grapevine, that's awesome. We're happy to have you here. Um, please make sure to uh, look into our organization a little bit more. We obviously had to, you know, we, we worked very hard to scramble to get um, this virtual conference together for you all. Um, I'm going to provide a link in the text box here that will allow you to um, join us as a member and even possibly more importantly, if you are a current member, which I hope all of you are, um, because you did not register for a paid conference this year, um, you will need to um, renew your membership uh, manually. So it will not auto renew with your registration for the conference. So um, I'm just going to type in membership renewal in here. Please, please click it, renew your membership. If you're not a member with us, um, we would love for you to join. Uh, Jamie did a wonderful job today. Um, and then if you did enjoy today's session, um, like I had mentioned, we are bringing this to you um, uh, on our own FEMC dime and uh, appreciate any support you can give us. Um, Giving Tuesday was just this week, a little early this year. <laughs> Um, so we are taking donations and you can please consider giving to FEMC and the link is in the in the text box. So well, unfortunately, we're not able to recover all costs that went into putting um, on what would have been our in person conference. Um, so we really appreciate any support you guys have. Um, and uh, finally, uh, don't forget to join us for our next presentation tomorrow. We're hearing from some folks from UF Marine Sciences uh, from Grace 
Burmester. Hope I didn't butcher that name, but I know it's going to be a great presentation. We've had some awesome, awesome session presenters. So um, thank you again for joining and uh, I hope and we all hope to see you tomorrow. And Jamie, thank you so much.